In this video, we'll look at a brief overview of socket programming with both TCP and UDP. Let's get started. All right, let's take a brief look at socket programming with TCP and UDP. So far, we've looked at a number of different types of applications, and now we'll see a bit under the hood about how the code actually works. This will give you the tools to build your own network applications. We can think of the socket as the door between the network application, written by the application developer, and the transport layer, which is part of the operating system. We have two transport protocols to choose from when creating a socket. One is the UDP protocol, which is unreliable, meaning that if the underlying network loses a particular packet, the transport layer won't take any action to resend it. TCP, on the other hand, provides a reliable service, which not only resends lost packets, but on the receiving side, makes sure everything is delivered in order. Here's an example of a simple application, which reads characters from the keyboard, sends them to a server, which performs a manipulation of the character, and sends them back to the client, which displays them on the screen. Because UDP doesn't worry about reliability or reordering, it also doesn't need to establish a connection per se. So there's no handshake, which cuts down on control packets, and the sender must tell the socket what IP address and port number to send each datagram to. The application could send different packets to different IP addresses if it so desired. When the receiver reads the packet, it learns what IP address sent it and what port number it came from, and that's how it's able to respond. So here's an exchange from our basic UDP application. On the server side, it creates a port running on a particular port number. Remember that port numbers are specific to either UDP or TCP. So while port 80 on TCP is typically reserved for HTTP traffic, port 80 on UDP is completely separate and can be used by a different application. When we create the socket, we have to tell it what type of socket we need. In this case, we're using a datagram socket, meaning UDP. The other parameter used in creating the socket is the address family INET, or internet. This is telling it that we want an IPv4 socket. The client side is also going to create a socket of the UDP type, specify the port number and IP address of the server, and send a datagram through the socket. The server side will need to be listening and read the datagram that arrived at the socket. The server can then write the reply back to the same socket, specifying the IP address and port number that it learned from the incoming packet. The client can then read the packet that it got in return, and if it's not planning to send any more packets, it can close the socket. Here's how the code looks in Python. Python is a particularly easy program to use for socket programming. First, you'll see that we import the socket module. We specify the name of the server, the port number for the server, the socket type, a string of ASCII text for the message. We encode that string into UTF-8 and use the send to call to specify the server's name and port number and send the datagram. We then use the receive from call on the socket to listen for the reply. When the reply comes back, we decode it and print it to the screen. The socket is then closed. On the server side, we also need to import the socket module and specify the port that will be listened on. This port needs to match the one being used by the client to send the messages. We then create the UDP socket, and on the server side, we call bind. So now the server is listening on that port number. Note that we didn't specify an IP address on the server, so the server will listen on all IP addresses that it has available. Our server also runs in a while loop, so it can receive multiple messages and respond to them. When the server calls the receive from function, it gets not only the message, but the client's address. So after the message is decoded and converted to uppercase, it can send the resulting string back to the client that sent the original message. Now let's see how TCP is different. At the beginning of the connection, the client needs to connect to the server before it can send data. This is done using the handshake process and some slightly different commands from what we just saw with UDP. Now on the server side, instead of using the same socket to listen for messages from any client, when the server receives a message from a client, it produces a new socket that's only used for communicating with that client. So once the connection is established, there's a socket pair that's only used for one communication flow. The server may support working with multiple clients, but they each need to have a socket on the server. We'll go through this in a lot more detail in the next chapter. Keep in mind that TCP is providing reliability and in-order delivery. So let's look at our TCP application interaction. So again, the server needs to be up and running first. It creates a socket and listens on a particular port, this time a TCP port. Note that instead of bind, we use the accept function call to start listening for incoming connections. The client also creates a socket, and when it has something to send, it will first connect to the server. Once the connection is established, then the client can send data. In this case, the application is sending its request to the server, and the server will read the request and send the reply back. The server doesn't need to keep track of the IP address and port number separately in the application because that's built into the socket. 
Once the socket is created, it only communicates with one client. Once the reply is received, both sides can close their socket. Now let's look at the code that makes that happen. First, the client. The first difference that we noticed compared to the UDP code is that we're creating a SOC stream socket. That's where we're telling it to use TCP. The line following it is also new. That's the connect call for the handshake is performed with the server. Because we specified the server name and server port in the connect, when we actually perform the send, the socket already knows where to send the data. And so the string is the only argument to the send call. We can then call receive to wait for the response from the server. And once we get it, we can decode it and print it out just like before. Let's look at the server side. Again, the server has created a SOC stream socket this time for TCP. But after it binds to that port, it calls listen, which is different from what we saw in the UDP server. Then inside the while loop, we have the accept call. This is where the new socket is generated based on the incoming connection. When the data arrives to the server and is received, the server doesn't have to worry about keeping track of the client's IP address and port number because that was already handled in the accept call and the socket knows what port and IP address it's connected to. So the server can capitalize the sentence and send it back without having to specify the IP address and port number at that point. Then the socket is closed and the loop continues waiting for new connections. Remember that we're just closing the connection socket, which was used only to communicate with this one client. We still have the server socket that's open, listening for new connections to come in. So there you have it. Now you can create your own network applications. Note that while we used Python in this example, it is mainly because it's a very straightforward program to understand and start out with. However, there are other options that are much more efficient and performant. If you want to try some other languages, I recommend Go, which is very similar to Python in level of complexity, but with much better memory efficiency and performance. This brings us to the end of chapter two, so let's look at a quick summary of what we've covered. We saw the client-server architecture for applications, as well as the peer-to-peer -peer architecture. And remember that from a software architecture standpoint, a peer-to-peer -peer application just runs a client and a server on each host. We saw how different applications have different requirements of the network and expect different services. Some need reliability, others need high bandwidth, and still others need low latency. We talked briefly about the differences between TCP and UDP, reliable versus unreliable transport. The next chapter will focus on this in much greater detail. We also looked at some of the most common protocols on the internet, including HTTP, SMTP, and DNS. Then in our last video, we looked at video streaming applications and how they are supported by content distribution networks, or CDNs. For each of the applications talked about, we learned something about their protocols. We saw that many protocols rely on some sort of request and reply message exchange. Typically, this is initiated by the client, which then either sends data to the server or requests data from it. Part of these message formats include headers, which contain metadata about the data or the request, as well as the data, which is the information actually being exchanged by the protocols. Throughout all of this, we saw the theme of scalability, which is important to most network applications and causes the application architects to choose particular engineering trade-offs. That completes chapter two. We'll see you in the next video when we start chapter three. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.